Hello. Uh, right now, I'm here with Barbara Music, who is a parent who has adopted a child. And I'll actually let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Hi. I'm, like she said, Barb, Barbara or Barb Music. And um, I am a parent of actually two children. One child is biological, and the second child, our daughter, is adopted from Romania. And we adopted her in. My husband and I adopted her in 1998 after at least two years of waiting for her in the process that we had to go through. And um, she is now, of course, um, she was four years old at the time. She is is almost 29 now. And uh, we found it to be, um, it's been a really good, um, positive um thing in our life we were very blessed to have a, adopted her um it was a little bit difficult going through the adoption process because things at that time were just full of a lot of bureaucracy and um things that were not known and we had a lot of trouble and a lot of long wait to to actually adopt but um we're finally happy that you know that it went through and we were able to have a daughter in our lives. So. Alrighty. So first, let's talk about some of the preparation that goes into adoption. How did you find out about adoption? Well, I don't remember exactly where I heard of it first, but I did hear a local woman giving a talk somewhere about international adoption and adoption in general. And that turned out to be, um, I don't know if it was at a church or someplace else that we happened to be at or heard about and thought, you know, we were thinking we couldn't have any more children. So we decided to look into adoption. So we heard about this person and that turned out to be the woman that we decided to talk to. And, and we were going to at first pursue adoption through China. Is this okay what you're looking for? Um, at that point in time, so that would probably been 1990 maybe and so we had started filling out paperwork to go to China and um, then um, a few months into that program the the woman who, who ran this adoption agency in town that we were you know we were really inspired by her because she had a large family and a lot of adopted um, children too and just made it sound like it was a really good thing to do. Um, but she called a meeting for all the families that were thinking about going to China and said that they, China was now having, it's putting in more rules into place that would say, if you already had a child, which we did, that you would have to wait longer and that you would have to accept a child, automatically accept a special needs child. We weren't against that exactly, but we kind of didn't want to wait too much longer. And we know that actually from listening to, can I use the name of the woman that we went through? Yes, that would um, be very helpful. Deb, Deborah Murphy Schoenman, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, Schoenman. Um, and she is, ran an agency called Special Editions in the Kansas City area. And um, anyhow, she met with our the parents and said, or the, the potential families and um, about these new rules that were coming into effect. So then we, um, she said she had some other programs available in some other countries um, like Russia and Romania and maybe Vietnam, I'm not sure exactly which, which areas. And we were looking at some picture books and we decided to go to Romania because um, our, um, my husband's family heritage is from Slovakia. And we thought, well, that's kind of near that part of Europe. And we thought that would be kind of an interesting way to go about adopting. And we knew that Romania had been having a lot of problems and had a, a large need for children. There are a lot of children in their system, in their um, orphanages that needed homes. So then we started our process and our paperwork specific to Romania, and um, it, it was a long process. It was a lot of um, getting information. We had to do background checks. We had to um, get our employees um, on board, our, our um, employers, you know, they had to, to fill out paperwork saying that we actually had these jobs. Um, it's been a long time, so I'm trying to think of all the details. Uh, we had, you know, to go to the... Um, I'm trying to remember um, the name of the agency, but it was, you know, a government agency where we had to, you know, part of our background checks, get our fingerprints done. We had to do a state background check, and then we had to do stuff internationally to, to travel to Romania and to 
to adopt and, and um, get all these this whole um, dossier put together. And so we we tried to really schedule a lot, a lot of time to get that paperwork done, and it took several months. And we felt finally we, that we had gotten there. And then you have to have a home study done where they send a social worker out to your house and they interview you and try to determine if you're um, if this is the appropriate setting to place a child for any kind of an adoption. You have to do that and pass that part of the procedure. And then we um, we waited and waited and waited and waited. And a lot of things were going on politically, bureaucratically in Romania at the time where um, there were some people, and I don't know if you want all of this detail, but I can remember bits and pieces of, but there was a woman on the European Union's board of approval or advisors, and she was like an, an ambassador type of appointee to, she was British, but was appointed to Romania. And so there was a lot of stuff going back and forth, and apparently she had an a not so good situation with international adoption in her own life with adopting a child. I, that's a rumor. It could be true. I don't know if it was absolute. Um, so she developed a negative attitude about international adoptions, and you may be able to learn more about that. Um, and and she had a lot of sway with the Romanian people, government. So she would put out things saying, you know, Romania needs to stop this. If they want to join the European Union, they can't have any international adoptions. Things to that effect. And they, um, so that slowed things down for us too. And then all of a sudden it became so late we had to do another whole background check because it, a year had passed. We had also met with our state representative and a, and a lawyer trying to get things moved along, along with our adoption worker. At this time we had to work with our local adoption person from Special Editions, but we also were working with a company that was licensed already to do the, the legal part of the adoption through um, through Romania. Because Deb was not specifically licensed yet to complete the adoption in Romania, even though she had been out there and had visited the children and gotten pictures. So we were working with another organization called Hand in Hand International out of Colorado and so they were doing a lot more with our paperwork. So we had to go back and get letters from our employers again and get um, the background check and so this is probably at least a year in to the whole procedure and then um, I think it, it was either before we had to get the second round of paperwork done or slightly after that um, so maybe it was later, it was a little bit later um, we've been matched up with a little this little girl, Mariana, who became our daughter. Um, they sent they called us one day at special editions and said, We have a a child that we'd like to show you and uh, pictures and if you and your husband could come in and and talk to us, we wanna see if this would be a good match. So we went in and saw her videos of her and some pictures and fell in love with her immediately. Adorable little girl with curly light brownish brown blonde hair and um Big eyes and big eyelashes, very tiny. Um, for a, we, we we thought she was about a year old then, or year and a half old. Um, I think we said we said yes right away. We came home and told our son, who was ten or nine at the time, and he was really excited. He looked at the picture and said, "That's my little sister," and he was very very happy and excited. So a few days later, we got a call from our local adoption agency saying there was some discrepancies with her age and I think she's already um, two years old and then later on we got some you know a few months of that we got no now she's three years old or something to that effect so there's a lot of information that they didn't have very clearly um, indicated but it, it was fine with us we'd already fallen in love with her and, and knew she was our daughter so um, continued to wait and wait and wait painted her bedroom did all that you know decorated her bedroom waiting, not knowing when we were going to see her in person, and, and months went by, and um, and and we maybe get some, when Deb would go out to Romania and other countries, she would send us pictures. All of a sudden, we heard that Romania had um, done something crazy where they decided to, like, start all over or take all the names that were matched up with families off of whatever 
um, records that they had and and not have them matched up anymore. I, I kind of picture it like a big board. I know it wasn't like this, but a big board with names and they just took everything down. Um, so our local agency was very proactive, but they couldn't really do anything in our case. But they got they contacted the lady in Denver and said, you have to get out there right away and match up our families with their children again. And so that woman did get into gear and she went out there and was able to get us reconnected with the children that we'd already planned to adopt and had a lot of paperwork on. So um, that was probably mid-summer or early summer, maybe, of 1998. And then we finally heard in July at some point that we could go and get her. And we knew another family, a couple other families in the Kansas City area that also also we were told that they could go and get their their children. So we were all frantically making our plans and we um, got our airfare ready and were able to travel the end of July into early August. And so we had our gotcha day, I, guess, I, I believe it's around August 2nd. I, I may be off by a couple of days, but it was somewhere in early August was our actual gotcha day. We got there and met her like the second day in and then had to go through the process of um, going to the embassy and and also she had to have a, a medical exam there and they said that she um, was delayed as if she was a four-year-old at this point had turned four in May um, but it was now August and she um, was delayed not speaking much language in her own tongue as a four-year-old just a few syllables and, and things but she could understand and she could point. And when we met her, um, they spoke a little in Romanian to her to explain what's going on. And and was able to, we were able to con kind of communicate with pointing in sort of a simple sign language. And she, she was really, I think, excited to get out of this orphanage. When we got to the orphanage to get her, um, they had her outside with it in like an orphanage with slightly older kids, not the babies. This would be like toddlers. And so she was all very suntanned and her hair was kind of bleach blonde and she had, her feet were bare and they had like calluses on them. So I could tell she'd been outside playing a lot. She was strong, but very skinny and tiny and kind of awkward arm movements. But she, um, they attributed that to possibly having rickets when she was younger. So she was only about 26 to 29 pounds at age four, which is very small, mal malnourished. And that's what they told us when we brought her to Bucharest and she was examined there. Um, but but otherwise strong and healthy. Um, I think a lot, I, we could tell she was hungry a lot when she would go around to the tables and, you know, at the hotel they'd have a buffet and she'd want to pick up everything and try it. And she, she just liked trying all kinds of food. She didn't even know how to wear a dress. I remember that that was kind of interesting. So I had to kind of demonstrate here, you have this little dress to put on over your clothes. Um, and she liked that because she was tucking him into her pants. And she, um, when we first got her, they of course took her back into the orphanage and um, took all her clothes off of her. And so she was really had nothing. So of course we brought clothes for her and gifts for the orphanage. But um, she was so excited to have these gifts. And then they, for a picture, they put her in a crib with several other children. And I think that confused her because she almost started to cry, thinking that she was going to be um, staying and not going because they told her, you're going to go. You're going to have a family. And I realized she probably had no understanding what that really meant. But she was kind of excited. And I, I attribute it to her. Um, zest for life, her desire to get out and, and live her life, you know, and see what's out there. So, you know, just, I was just appreciative of that, but she really bonded with me right away. She, she let us hold her and we got into the car. I was sitting, I was in the car with the other mom, a friend of ours and her new daughter and the husbands were in a second car. So they had, because we had air conditioning in our car and it was very hot while we were there, but she sat on my lap kind of facing me and just let me hold her the whole ride. She put her head down and um, really kind of bonded, I think. And I, I had a bracelet that I gave her and she put that on. So it was, it was pretty sweet. And um, we just kind of rode, it was like two and a half hours back to Bucharest. And um, though it, it, 
it wasn't always perfect or easy. She had some meltdowns, I think, from her inability to communicate to us what she needed, um, especially going into an elevator. It was very scary for her. So we ended up having to walk up all these flights of stairs. And then um, a bath was totally seemed foreign to her. And she didn't know what to make of that. Um, but eventually she got used to those things. Um, and, and she, it really surprised me that um, we put her into, I think at night, we put some chairs together, some side chairs. So we thought she might roll off. So we had some chairs with arms that she slept in that, and we slept in like a rollout bed at this apartment the first night. And she, um, we put something on her, some pajamas on her, and she somehow managed to get up at night and take that off and put something else on that she found that was sitting on the table that she liked better or something. So it was pretty cute. I had no idea that she was capable of being able to you know, dress herself, but she was almost four, or was just four. Um, so... I'm trying to think what else we happened in Romania, but it was pretty much we went did some sightseeing while we were there, but mostly we were exhausted and couldn't wait to get home. So we got home and um, our friends met us at the airport, and um, and and it the flight home was completely tiresome. She cried almost the whole flight home from Romania to Amsterdam, and she stopped crying when we got to Amsterdam, and she played at the airport. Then we got on the flight from Amsterdam to Chicago. She cried most of the way from that flight. No one could console her. Even a Romanian grandfather came back to us and said, I'm a grandfather. I'll take care of her. So I said, fine, have at it. Cause, and, and he comes back two minutes later with her, hands her back to us. No, I can't help her. <laughs> it was funny. We tried putting Dramamine in her little Tootsie Roll candy to see if she would take it. And she flung it down the airplane. <laughs> she didn't know what it was. She didn't. She just thought, I'm just going to throw this thing. So she was pretty funny. A lot of personality. and um, But, you know, in the, in, for the most of it, I mean, it was adjustments that we had to deal with, with her, mm -hmm. with temper tantrums that were, or actually like a meltdown. When things got to be too much, too much stimulus, too much um, information coming in, and her inability to process all this newness was very hard for her. So um, I, I was able to stay at home for a while for, for several months before I went back to work. And then I went back to work part time just to be able to help her because we ended up taking her right away to the doctor and we took her in for um, evaluations because she was four. And they did say she would need help with an IEP right from the start with speech therapy, with occupational therapy, and is there anything else? I think those were the two big ones, speech and occupational, learning things like tying your shoes and stuff. So she, but she eventually would need more help with reading and the basics and, and you know, school was just a very hard thing. Um, I have an interesting story. I don't know if you want to hear this one, but I, her, her first Christmas with us, talking about the, um, all the um, input that you're getting, too much input and so, of course, she's getting all these presents, and there's all these decorations on Christmas morning, and then there's more presents, and there's more, and there's food, and there's all this going on, and she'd only been with us like five months or so at this point. And all of a sudden, she just looked at me, and she kind of burst out crying, and she just couldn't contain it all. And, um, and she cried so hard that eventually she just sort of fell into my arms, and fell asleep for several hours, and I just held her, and it was a really, it was kind of a special moment. I think she was, she wasn't so much sad as just overwhelmed by everything, because these kids had to share toys at the orphanage. They didn't get to have their own anything, and just to have things was, was a new whole experience, so that, but that was still a sweet memory that I have. Um, and then, you know, she ended up going to school, and and getting extra help from um, her IEP to help her, we thought, get caught up. And, um, and she, was, she was a really good student. The, the teachers would always recommend her as a friend to other kids that needed a friend because she was um, a nice kid that just didn't have any um, meanness except, you know, once in a while with her brother when she didn't get her way, like a typical kid. But no, you know, she, she was, she was a, a good, sweet kid that liked everybody and you know it was hard still for her because she still was a little different and mm -hmm. her speech and her 
ability to understand things. Um, um, she was later diagnosed with some um, intellectual disabilities, challenges, learning challenges, and you know that as, she, as school got harder, those got harder for her, and it was frustrating for her. Um, so we would we would work with the therapists and the school people and outside, and we had a lot of really good people to help us with that, um, you know, navigating that whole area, but really helped make her able to um, get through school a lot better. Um, is there anything else you would like me to share about that time early or going into more of our lives? Well, actually, there are a few details sure. that I'd like to focus more on. Um, so you mentioned that you adopted a special needs child. Could you explain a little bit more about what that designation means? Yes. When, when we were told about special needs, we were told by Deb that that could mean they might have a crooked little baby toe or might be missing a baby toe. But it could also be all the way up to the level of, you know, severe autism or severe physical disabilities where they um, have to be in a wheelchair, for example, or they could be blind. So the special needs can be any, any type of, and they could have Down syndrome, they could have, in our case, intellectual challenges, which um, is pretty much what she had, um, which I think were due to the fact that early, early cognitive development in an orphanage, there was no like one-on-one -on -one contact with the mother in, in, um, in a regular way because the people in those orphanages at that time were not really trained in really good child care for early development. Um, they just did the best they could. They were overwhelmed with so many children and not trained um, that that I don't, that a lot of these stories that I've heard about kids, I, I mean, they would stare at their hands and their fists and just kind of like, and, and they just didn't have language coming at them a lot that, you know, they might have been held a little bit, but they, they were told, don't hold the kids because then the, the, they'll all want to be held at the same time and they'll all cry. So they, so the kids did not get that early baby stimulation. Um, I know in some cases, kids can get, you know, good, that really good care if, the orphanages provide that, you know, really, they, you know, as a, um, as their goal. And so those kids can maybe turn out better. But in Romania at that time, it was very hard to get really good trained. Um, and in fact, Deb Murphy did kind of make that her, one of her life goals is she established an orphanage in Moldova, which is right near Romania, to be an example of how we can take care of these kids and raise them in a healthy way as possible. And a lot of the families in Kansas City help support that with um, contributions and people going there to help out and volunteer. And that became kind of like a really good example mm -hmm. of how, we, how you can raise um, the, these kids, right, with hopefully minimal special needs. Now, some kids are going to be born with it, but in our case, Mariana's were more intellectual and mental. Her, um, her health was not affected, so she was a really good athlete. Although we did find out later on, as an adult, part of the struggles she had with her learning probably were related to vision. And all along, in her vision tests, we were told her vision was was fine. It was good. She's, she can see great, you know, 2020 vision. And then, um, and then when she wanted to drive, she really struggled with it. And so we ended up taking her to driving therapy as an adult. And... It was a special driving therapy, and the woman there said she really needs some specialized vision therapy, and she recommended a place to go. So we went to see a Beth, Dr. Beth Bazine, who specialized in um, in vision therapy, and she evaluated Mariana at length and determined she had something called Streff syndrome, which is something where if um, the eyes aren't working. Um, correct or in sync with your cog, your brain. They're not working in, in the same way. I mean that typical people are seeing and processing and comprehending the information. So as she was younger, grade school, trying to understand reading, the more frustrated she would get trying to read those letters, process what they meant, and comprehend what they said, 
she would get more frustrated and then her brain would not react right so she would the letters would start to blur and we didn't even know this was happening she would just be crying sometimes when we were trying to help her with her schoolwork so if we if we'd known about this at that time she might not have been able to get therapy at that time for this specific thing but it, they just did not see it in traditional eye tests mm -hmm. so as an so then as an adult a few years ago she was able to get the specialized vision therapy that helped her brain work cognitively with her vision and it really worked so this therapy we were so grateful it actually helped her and processing what she was seeing. She could do this in sports for some different reason, but when you're in a car, your brain's gonna process things a little differently because you can you're kind of confined to the space mm -hmm. and you're trying to see, you know, up close, far away, and all the information that you're bringing in. So anyhow, the, this therapy really helped her to overcome a lot of that. And so she's able to drive now and work full time which we were just so grateful for that she was able to overcome so much that we didn't even, some of the things we didn't even see or know about till she was an adult. So mm -hmm. um, as far as special needs, that's what we understood. And you mentioned that she had an IEP? Yes. Um, what does it's, that mean? Okay, an IEP is an individual education plan. So that is given by the school district when they are able to determine a, a child needs extra help in getting to the same level as their peers, basically. That's how I understand it. So they come up with a plan using, you know, the school, the teachers, the special ed teachers, the regular, some of the regular teachers, the principal might be involved, and therapists. Maybe they have a speech therapist at the school or another similar specialist, and they will determine um, things like, um, here's, here's our goal for this school year, to read so many words per minute or to be able to write so many words per minute, um, th things like that, and to understand what you're reading. Uh, so so we did that kind of, um, that's what they did for school. I don't know how much it helped, to be honest. It seemed like, it, you know, they did the best that they could, but she wasn't making very much progress in her schoolwork. We ended up trying different therapies. We did a specialized reading program when she was probably a, a freshman in high school where she went to another therapy. If we'd known that this was the other, if the eye vision problem we were aware of that might have helped at that time too. But um, so she, she was taken out of school for at least two or three days a, a week to go to this other program. And, but it only helps such a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. there was only such a little bit of progress made with that, a lot of therapy, that it was really frustrating for everybody, um, especially her. And then, we also tried another type of brain therapy. I'm trying to think what it was called, but basically it was to stimulate the parts of how the brain works together. Um, electro, it was like she had electromagnetic things placed on her head and she had to follow certain things on a TV screen and supposedly it would give feedback in the brain to help it um, process things better. And I, and I think I believe in some of that as being really good, but um, Again, I think for her progress, it was so minimal that the process, that the the progress that she made on it, there was a little, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And again, later we tried the vision therapy, and that really seemed to be a big deal changer for us. So. Did you have to disclose that she was adopted to get the IEP, or no? I, I think we disclosed it anyhow, just in explaining her background as you know language. Um, her, her language being delayed um, that, you know, and, and so they had to bring in like a, they brought in a translator, but it didn't help a whole lot in her initial evaluations. I mean, because she wasn't really speaking in Romanian yet. She knew a couple words and they might've been able to say some things to her, but it didn't help her understand things better. Mm -hmm. um, so, but being, so, so yeah, we didn't, we didn't, we never minded disclosing anything about her being adopted. That was not a problem for us. And I don't, as now that she's an adult, I don't think that was a problem for her. I think being, telling people that she may have an intellectual challenge has been a problem. And that she doesn't necessarily like to tell or share that to too many people. Um, she, but she's proud of her Romanian heritage. So that's, it's, it's, I mean, she may tell you something different, but that's what she's always 
seem to tell us she likes mm-hmm. that she's Romanian and hopes to go back someday and and visit the country. Um, we've always tried to make that a, a special thing for her because we think it's pretty neat. Um, so you mentioned that the local agency that you worked with was Special Editions. Yeah. Did you consider any other agencies? Not really. I think uh, we were just really taken by Deb's um, life philosophy and inspired by her and the fact that she, you know, had helped, you know, so many people and the families that we met there and that she had taken into her own home and family so many children and some with severe special needs. Some She had like 10, I think at least 10 children, a mix of biological children and adopted children that she and her husband had and some were pretty severely special needs. So the reason why she called it special additions is, you know, to help special needs children be adopted. Although not all the kids that were adopted, you know, still had recognizable needs, but, um, you know, some did. Did you do any extra research into special additions before you decided to work with them? That's a good question. Um, I don't recall doing anything. I mean, we, we might have looked into Catholic charities as we're Catholics, but um, I don't know if they had done much um, international adoption. So a lot of the families that in this area have been going through special editions for international adoption. And one of the reasons, I think I'd read an article about international adoption and thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting because I was fearful of adopting domestically that I'd heard stories, probably horror stories about mothers coming back or something happening and it wasn't done right. And I was so afraid of it being disrupted that I didn't want to, to go that route. And I just felt right or wrong. I don't know if it was um, that, you know, going international would hopefully prevent some of that from happening. I, I mean, I'm sure that it could still happen for some people, but I didn't want to do the domestic. Although, you know, I think I'd be more open to it nowadays now that I've learned more. So now I kind of want to go into more detail about the legal side of these things. You mentioned that you had to do paperwork, background checks, and a home study. Yeah. Could you go into more detail about those? Like maybe what paperwork you had to fill out, what were they Uh. looking for during the home study, stuff like that. I'll, I'll try. I'm not very good at remembering it so long ago, but maybe my husband can help with some of that. Um, I think they're looking for st- the stability in your home life that um, that's at least how I would have looked at it too. Um, that as a married couple, you know, that you um, got along well, that you had similar goals, that you both had jobs, that you could keep jobs and were in, in and out of work. I think they're looking at possibly some of those things that they're probably looking at how you kept your home. Was your home at least was it at least free of you know dangerous things that could could hurt a child, or you, that you really took those into consideration? How how if you had children at the home? I think they looked at the social worker would look at how how is that child developing? How are they um, growing and getting along in their community and and um, how are, how are the, even how are the parents involved in the community? What kind of things do you do? What kind of um, do you volunteer? Do you attend church? Do you you know friends? And so you'd have to get friends to write letters of recommendation, and your employer had to write a re- letter of recommendation. They just want to make sure I think that you're stable and able to um, to take a child, and and they, cause they want they want to look out for the best interests of this child coming into your home. Mm-hmm. Because you already had a biological child. Do you think that made these checks easier or harder? Maybe it made it a little easier. I, I haven't really thought too much about it. I thought, you know, maybe looking back, I, would, um, I think it might have made it easier because I thought we were doing a fairly good job with our son, that he was, you know, pretty well, doing pretty okay at school, that he was, um, you know, happy, happy enough kid, um, healthy, and... And we did things like parents' as teachers program when our son was really young. So we were open to 
you know, getting the help that we needed. We didn't have close family living nearby when our children were, even the first year we adopted Mariana until my sister moved into town. But, um, but we had networks of friends from work and from our church and, and things like that, that, and neighbors that were very helpful. So I think they want to see that you're involved in your community, that you, um, you will get the help you need if you need help. So mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Now, you mentioned that you worked with a second agency called Hand in Hand International. Yes. Was that an agency that was partnered with special editions or were you allowed to choose the other agency? I don't, I think they were recommended to us by special editions because they knew they were specifically licensed to go and do the finalized adoptions in Romania. So um, they, yeah, again, we kind of didn't, we, we didn't really know what else to look for at the time. And of course we didn't have the internet as handy. There wasn't much on the internet to research current things going on in that sense of, you know, what are people doing for, for um, adoptions. I think some things had started. There were some, maybe some, some pages and stuff on that were just beginning to start up about adopting. And we actually met one of the other parents that her daughter came from the same orphanage as our daughter, but they were able to get her the year before. But now our daughters are both really close friends and they've been friends their whole lives. And that's been kind of a cool thing too. So um, on the topic of like research and resources, did you have any specific resources that you remember using? Just, I, I think I just went to the library and got, you know, maybe a few magazine articles and books. Maybe there was a book, but I just, I, I honestly can't remember the name of it. But I remember reading a book before we committed to it, you know, going mm -hmm. to see um, anybody about adoption. And it just kind of talked a little bit about it and about, um, you know, things to consider, you know, versus domestic adoption versus international adoption and what's what's out there. Mm -hmm. So, but I remember reading that and thinking, well, maybe this is something we could do since we wanted more children and mm -hmm. started to consider that. So as far as the matchmaking process goes, do you know any like specific details about how they do that? Actually, I don't. That would be really interesting to ask them about. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we said we were open to whatever, boy or girl, and, um, and you know, the age wasn't too important. We, we knew the younger the child, the less chance, I mean, they might have less of special needs, possibly, because um, usually if they're in longer, it, it can affect them. But um, we just were kind of like, you know, trusting in our faith in God um, that, you know, this is the same, which is actually to us the same as adopting, as, as in, in a way a biological child. You, you don't know if your biological child is going to have any needs that they're born with or develop as they grow older, too. So I think, um, you know, to us, it was similar, you know, we, you, you can't control a lot of things. So. Did you have any conditions that would have made you say, no, we're not adopting that child? I mean, when they first gave us the, um, the information about her and say, here was a child we think you would like to adopt? Would right. Did you have any deal breakers in that sense? Like maybe, um, this will sound a little silly, but I don't want a child who has purple hair. Yeah. Or like no arms or something. I... I don't think we did put any conditions. We did not put any conditions on that because I think we just, you know, whatever child they wanted to give us would be mm -hmm. what, um, and, that, and I think, I, I like I said, I don't know what they consider when they have these needs. And I think they're trying to find homes for the children they know will be, or they hope will be a good survivor. Does that make sense? Um, Maybe I'm, this is my own, on my own like thing. I wonder if they're thinking, you know, this child may have this to overcome, but they're strong and can probably overcome this. And maybe I don't think they're weeding out any children. I'm not by saying that. I'm just saying that they're probably, 
they're probably looking at things like they, they can offer this and they can offer this. You know, maybe if a family said, oh, we have this experience and we can really handle this child that needs round the clock physical care and, you know, other care, that they would know that. But we didn't specifically say that we didn't have that. We just, you know, we didn't have that. So we would have been kind of open to whatever. You've mentioned a lot that you put your faith in God to help you find the right child. Right. So what role did religion play in your choice to adopt? Um, it was huge. It was, it's, it's all about what, how I like, how I choose to live my life and my husband, we, we live, choose to live our life is we want to trust God with everything that God wants to give us or do for us or even take away from us. So it was hard to realize that we could probably not have a child. We lost through miscarriage, a few, few children, um, the different stages very early. And that was very hard because I don't, we always, when we got married, we wanted to have several children. And, but our belief is God is the determinant the of that, you know, is, are we, we can't just go out necessarily. You can't, and I, I adoption may, people may think like, are you just consuming a child? You're, you're buying a child, but it's not that easy. We learned, you cannot just get a child, say, I want a child. And I mean, it was a long, hard process waiting for her. And wondering if we would ever get, you know, after you were matched. First, you're not even matched. And then you're matched and you're waiting. And I remember specifically things like um, wondering how she's doing over there. What's ha going on? You don't know, you know, could she be getting really sick because it's so cold and they're having these really cold winters. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. So you have to trust God for that. And you have to um, know that. He's putting, I, I believe he was matching up to the big picture through the, through the um, adoption staff people. He was able to give us a child that we needed and that needed us. And, mm -hmm. and so I, um, I, I truly believe in that. And that's what God gives us the strength to handle whatever he's going to give us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and help us through that um, whole process. So it, it's the, the most important thing. Well, another thing that you mentioned was that there was a little bit of confusion regarding your adopted daughter's age yes. at the orphanage. Could you, like, do you know more about why that was or? I'm not exactly sure why that happened. There's still some confusion about not her age so much, but siblings. They kept saying she had another sister when they went out to kind of rematch the families that she had another a sister who was also named the same name, Mariana. And that, um, and so there was confusion like which one was which. Um, and, and there's, I, we also have some information a little bit more detailed. I, I won't go into any of that, but um, about the biological parents um, that was very concerning and upsetting once we got out there that we learned. But I'm trying to think where I was going with that. Um, that... So, so there, you know, the age wasn't so, so much. It was surprising. But we kind of just went with it. Again, I think that's when our faith came in, too. It's like, well, you know, God, you take care of this. This child, whatever age, we still love her. She's ours, and she's grown up really fast all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, but as far as, um, as far as age goes, so we know, we know a little bit. We know the mother's name um, and how old she was, but we don't know too much else. Mm -hmm. And uh, except that there were some things that were disturbing that... Um, do you remember the name of the orphanage that she came from? I don't remember the name of the orphanage, but the city was Fushan, in out uh, maybe two hours north of, um, at least two hours north of Bucharest. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I can't remember the name because it was in Romanian. Um, 
did you do any research into the orphanage or there it was really hard to do research I mean there might I, I've tried to look some things up now I'm not sure because because I follow a Facebook group that is Romanian and I you know some some people are looking for their birth parents and stuff like that um, and we have a couple of friends of my daughter who went to Romania and met her birth their birth families in one family it went well one family it didn't go so well so you know they it's just um, a lot of different things and I've done some other researching into like Romania now and how a lot of the children um, that were in those orphanages grew up and had nowhere to go and became street kids and they live underground and a lot of them are sold into the sex trafficking or are drug addicts and and it's just so heartbreaking that that that's happened and and our daughter you know she knows that it that you know she was blessed in a way to be able to to come here not because of us but i mean blessed to be able to have a new life a, a different life outside of that which is so sad and you know if there's anybody that you know, to help out those kids, we would like to be able to find ways to do that. And I do have some friends that have missionary friends that they know that do that. Mm -hmm. And sort of related to that, you mentioned that you were a little worried that she might have had rickets or yeah. was malnourished. Yeah, when, when um, I'm not sure what's what showed that sign maybe it was how she held her arms when she walked and stuff but the doctor in Romania said that that you know that she was delayed that she had probably had rickets and was malnourished when we saw her doctor here shortly after we got back here um, he was very optimistic and thought she was pretty healthy and would catch up right away and like I said she she caught up pretty well physically but it was the intellectual part that that was still delayed and still is so it's um something's something's got a little better <laughs> mm -hmm. so another thing you mentioned was that when you told your biological son about her his new sister um, he said that's my little sister so how did you approach the whole situation about adoption with him? Um, I think it was, he was probably about eight or so. When we, he wanted siblings. He did. He really wanted some little siblings or some kids. A lot of his friends had younger brothers and sisters or older ones. And so that was part of the reason I, we wanted to adopt, too, is to give him a sibling. Um, it was you know, something that he was looking forward to. Once we started talking about it some more, he was looking forward to it. It was probably harder as a child to understand how this process was going to work. Um, but, you know, we talk, when we got the pictures and we said, what do you think? This is, is this, you're going to be your, your sister. And he jumped right into it and was like, yep, that's my sister. And accepted her like that right from the start. He was very excited. It was hard because she was she was an older toddler, not a newborn baby sister. So I think it was a little harder for him, um, as she was kind of more bonded to me and didn't really go to you know even her dad as much, but more you know to her brother. It took a little warm up for them to kind of become bonded as brother and sister, um, but it but it seemed to happen, and and now that it's good because now they. They don't um, hang out a lot or anything. It's, there's about a five-year age difference, but, you know, they do um, talk sometimes and, and can be good support to each other, especially, you know, for even person on personal issues. They, you know, can help mm -hmm. each other. So that's been kind of neat. So, Did you ever explain what adoption was to your son? Yeah, I we did. Um, we we kind of told him. We were pretty open about saying that we... Um, we want to have more children, but for some reason, you know, mom's body isn't working the way it should. And, and so we're not having children the way a lot of families do. And so he, um, he was like, okay. And then, and so we told him that, you know, we wanted to adopt a child from another country. 
and that would be your brother or sister. And we're just gonna we're gonna do all this paperwork, and we're gonna meet with people, and then we're gonna wait and see what happens. And whoever God decides to give us will be, you know, our your your sibling. And so he was kind of in, in the process with us all the way, mm -hmm. as, as far as he could understand it as a child. And um, he was pretty excited to have a little sister. He was happy and. Have you tried explaining adoption to him when he was older, or did you just leave it at that? Oh, you mean talk more about it? I think I felt a little bad when he was more of a teenager because I felt like I had to give her so much more attention with all the therapy and, you know, her having the, you know, other issues that she was going through as, as you know, with anxiety and stuff like that. So I think... Um, I felt guilty that, you know, sometimes I couldn't be there for him all the time when he needed it. But he, when I talked to him about it, he was fine, and he didn't, he hadn't noticed that when he, when I talked to him. Because mm -hmm. even though I felt it as a mom, like, oh, I feel like I haven't given you this time. I've given it more to her. It, he hadn't noticed it. Mm -hmm. So somehow or another, that was good. <laughs> he did all right. And for your daughter, have you explained what adoption was to her? Yes. We have explained a lot to her, and I think she, she um, and it kind of changed as we got a little older to explain how this all works and how we couldn't have children on our own after Paul, and that, um, and then, and then, you know, God gave us another child through adoption and, and gave us the idea because we were so grateful to have her as a child because we wouldn't have even thought of it if we couldn't have had our own children, at, that, at least in our at a point in that time, we were still thinking, we're going to have a, our children biologically, we'll have more children. But then when it seems like it wasn't happening, um, that's what opened our mind to like, let's adopt. We decided not to continue to adopt more children just because it was such a long drawn out process. It really, um, and, and the expense of adoption is pretty high, mm -hmm. that we decided not to adopt again for ourselves. And that, because we also knew we were, having to help follow through with Mariana on, on therapy and things that she needed. Mm -hmm. So, Were there differences in the way that you explained adoption to your son versus your daughter? Yeah, because I think she had a harder time understanding it. And she, she did for a long time. And I think she understands it a little bit better now. But once she asked me when she was probably middle school age or fifth grade or something close. Um, she had seen something, either seen something on TV or saw a mother with a little baby. And but she said something about um a baby being born all squishy and covered with, you know, the fluids or something. She'd said something about that. So when I was born, did I was I like that too? Did I have that, you know, was I a little baby like that? And that was really, I think, profound for me to think about that she didn't see herself in that same way as maybe a biological child would, even though she was biological to some other parents mm -hmm. or their daughter and born the same way, she didn't see herself the same. And that was kind of heartbreaking because I had to tell her, yeah, you, you were born the same way. But to understand, and this is the hardest part too, it's very hard for her to understand the parents giving up mm -hmm. their child. And in Romania, and at least we knew that the, the families were extremely poor and could not afford to feed their children or afford to care for them. So we did talk about that with all the political unrest and stuff going on in that country, that there was just um, a lack of ability to take care of their kids and so they were abandoning them from birth and sometimes I've heard stories where people would go back when their kids were old enough to work and make money like five-year-olds or something mm -hmm. that they would get them out of the orphanage so a lot of children had to wait until they were truly abandoned if the parents would visit once a year then they weren't abandoned mm -hmm. something like that did you ever discuss the legal aspect of adoption with your children I mean, I, I'm not sure if I thought of it so much in that respect. 
I mean, I just thought, well, it's done, it's done kind of thing. Um, especially since we, we wanted to go internationally, I figured it was, there's the question of citizenship. Um, and in, in, in her case, we had to file for citizenship again over here when she was home. So nowadays, I think, once you bring the child back, they're considered a citizen. Um, so we had to go through that. But it was a lot of fun in the sense that she became a citizen when she was in kindergarten. All the stuff was official, and she went to the courtroom and stuff. And then we made a special day at school and explained it to the little kids at school, and they had a party, and that was kind of fun. It's a learning experience. Um, you mentioned that you had to file for her citizenship. Yes. Do you were you? What agency did you work with for that? Uh, again, through our, um, this, I think it was through special editions, and, and I'm not sure, my husband might know better if it was through hand in hand, but um, we may have just had to, you know, do most of it ourselves and go through, what, what's the name, I can't think of the name of the, the um, our government agency that would do that, um, but... Yeah, he would know more about the, the technical stuff. I can't think of the name of the agency. But. Well, let's take it to a happier place now. Yeah. Um, could you describe how you felt when you first met her in person? Yes. I, I, I'm trying to, oh, it just was sheer joy to see her in person. And she's beautiful. And just to, you know see her eye to eye and hold her was just so much joy and um she was cuter than we even saw in her pictures and she was so like I said so strong she was she could swing on a swing they had there in the, in the it was all rusty swing set um and in this the fact that she welcomed us into her life just the same way by letting me hold her and letting dad hold her and just having this desire to be able to to go out and live life. Like, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go. I'm going to see the next thing and do the next thing. And, and I'll go with you guys, and I'll, and I'll let you take me. And, and that's, a, that's how I kind of read it. And um, her, her, just, her desire to, to be able to live life, have a zest for life, was really great. Do you remember what day that was? I used to have that absolutely in my head, but I can't remember if it was like August 8th or August 7th. Like I said, it's her gotcha day. Mm -hmm. um, but getting older, I, I'm, I've lost that and it's late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can't remember the date. So what exactly is a gotcha day? That's the day that actually, it might not have been the day I met her, but I can picture the day I met her. The gotcha day is the day that everything becomes official. So you have to go to the embassy and get paperwork signed. And again, it's been 25 years, so I, that's why I'm having a little bit of trouble remembering all these details. But maybe Dad can remember it. And so we call it Gotcha Day. It's kind of like a customary thing amongst adoptive families to celebrate the day they officially became yours. Um, I mean, I hope nobody has it. Something happened in that process where they aren't able to adopt at that point. Um, and so we usually try to celebrate every every year on that day. Take now we take her out to dinner, um, do something, go on a trip or something. If it coincides with something else we're doing, is yeah. that something? Where did you learn about gotcha days? Probably from the other adoptive families that we met, because our agency was good about having um, having like parties, like Christmas parties, and. And then a summer party with pool party. And so all the families that already adopted were the waiting families like us could go and talk to them and kind of learn, you know, what's going on, um, the procedure. So I might have seen it through there, heard it from other families. Did you go to these parties often? Yeah, we did all the time. We went to um, the local parties that were um, through Deb that she had. You know, there's always a Santa. And so everybody had, you know, presents that we all, you know, people brought different presents to share and for their kids. And um, there was food, people brought food. And so it was a lot of fun. And we'd get to meet families, not just the Romanian families, but the adoptive families from other places as well. 
And then in the summer, they would have a pool party, get together, usually um, at Deb's house because they had a big, big yard and pool. And then the other thing that we did as a family, we went on Romanian adoptive family um, reunions. So we went to two that I recall. One was in Virginia and one was in Colorado. And it was really pretty neat because um, we got to meet other families that you know, adopted from Romania, and they had different um, heritage events like arts and crafts, and, and then they'd have time, and the kids could all play in the pool, and they just had a blast, and we could, the parents could talk to each other and share different um, tips or just experiences on adopting, you know, you know, what, learning about IEPs, learning about, the, you know, what did you do for gotcha days or, or things, or, you know, what happened with your experience in adoption, so that was always really good, and um, we went to, to this, to that reunion twice, um, but, and we, I think we learned about that, I'm not sure if we learned about it through special editions or online at that point, things were starting to appear online, mm -hmm. and so more of an email thing that we would get information from. How old was Mariana when these happened? She was still pretty young, so the first one we went to, she might have been about six or seven, and maybe about eight or something or nine the next time we went and at one of them the ambassadors from Romania to the United States actually and I think of the Virginia one they came and he spoke and everybody was dancing it was like a, you know, a line dance all the way around the room at the final dinner kind of party that they had at the hotel um, so that was pretty good to kind of hear his and he, they were very supportive of the adoptions from their country even Though, at some point, Romania did finally shut down adoptions, and I think they're still shut down. It ends, you have to be related to the child mm -hmm. biologically. Um, so anyhow, that, that was just such a great experience, because we really wanted her and all these other families wanted them to be proud of their heritage. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another thing. I think it's, it's, so, it's so cool to have that, to have the, the heritage that you bring into your adopted family, you know, that, you know, we all love and celebrate that too, so. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you would sometimes exchange tips. Yeah. Do you remember any of these? Oh, yeah, tips could be, um, let me think if I can think of a tip, though. Um, it might have been things like how to deal with the meltdowns or how to, you know, what kind of food does your child like to eat because mine is picky eater or something or, or what, what kind of therapy did you use? You know, mm -hmm. did you, um, what helped your child overcome this? You know, so they might mm -hmm. mention this cognitive therapy and, and you're like, okay, we'll look into that or talk to this doctor. So that would be a really good resource. It was a really good resource for mm -hmm. finding out things that might help or, you know, recipes even. So I just, you know, it was, it was still mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of things. Were you more a listener or did you prefer to give advice? Um, probably a little bit of both. I think I, I was more like a learner. Oh, I want to try this. Or, yeah, can you tell me more about this? We need this. But it, um, but if there was something that I had heard about, I would be willing to share that too. We even heard one year from this young man at the time, is it a Ruckel, who he was um, in an orphanage that they called the home for the, um, gosh, something, it was, it was a very harsh term, this in Romanian, it wasn't the, the home for the, an un, not repairable, but something, unhope, no hope at all, you know, home mm -hmm. for kids, and because he had um, some type of deformity in his legs, and, um, and then he had a, a friend there who was blind, and then that Thing. They just figured these kids won't get adopted, and, and they were abused, and I think mostly physically abused, um, hit and stuff. But he he wrote a whole memoir, and he his whole goal, he was one of the kids that was on this 2020 TV show program when all the stuff was starting to come out about Ramin and, and these children being in overcrowded orphanages. They went into the um, one of the orphanages, a 2020 TV show crew, and... And he was in there, and it ended up one of the, the people involved with the show 2020 adopted him. He and his wife adopted Isidore. And, but it was a rough journey for them. Um, and, and he talks about that in his biography. 
um, although he's kind of reconciled, he's very close to his close to his parents now, but he's an adult now in his mm-hmm. 40s, I think. And he um, he goes back to Romania all the time. He's kind of an advocate for helping Romanians in all different kinds of situations and, um, and and helping with adoptions and stuff too. So that was pretty interesting. At the time he spoke, he was probably only t- maybe not even 20, you know, mm-hmm. but Mariana was probably 10 years younger or more. And he, he um, shares his story and he, um, you know, just trying to, you know, say, say how hard it was. Because we've heard a lot of other stories at some of those things about children who had such a hard time mentally, I think, and emotionally, um, whether they were not adopted or were adopted, you know, they would have still had these problems, mm-hmm. but um, that some of these adoptions had to be severed because the parents were in, in, you know, they had other siblings that were being hurt and stuff. So, um, th- those are such, they're rare, but we'd heard some really terrible, mm-hmm. sad, sad, sad cases were. Do you remember the name of his memoir? Um, I have it somewhere. I think I can find that for you. Um, let me look that up too. But, Do you keep in contact with any of the parents that you met at these meetings? Um... Only the ones that I know locally. So there's, um, I mean, we, we would email for a while, some of those families that we met at those reunions. And then there's the families that we see. We don't have any of those um, those yearly meetings anymore because um, the agency um, that Deb ran is no, I think it's, it might still be running with some other people. Her daughter took over. Dad passed away a few years ago after... Um, a long illness that she basically contracted from all her travels overseas, um, some kind of cancer. But she touched so many lives that there were so many people that um, came to her funeral and or her services. Um, but so so I kind of keep in touch with like at least a couple of the moms that are friends with um, my my daughter's friends with their daughters. And she kind of keeps in touch with some of them, but one she's very close with. Mm-hmm. So, and then other families. I do have some other families that aren't part of the Romanian groups that have um, adopted internationally or even domestically. That you know, we have to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. As far as the traveling went, um, did you have to arrange your daughter's passport? Yes. Um, how did we do that? We had to, they, I think, provided pictures there of her. Um, but that was also part of things. We had to bring some stuff with us to, to get her a passport there. And we had to have, I'm not sure if we did this after. that. Again, that's all that technical stuff. Um, we eventually had to get her a birth certificate from Kansas that said, you know, where she was, you know, that she's here. Mm-hmm. And to get a social security number, I think, was part of that. Did those come before or after the passport? I think that came after the passport. But I think when we were there, we got the full passport, and it was a Romanian passport. Because that's that's right. I think that's what it was. I think it was a Romanian passport for her to travel here. And so it had pictures of her in there that I think that they took. Mm-hmm. Did she have to come in on a visa then? I'm not sure if it was a visa or a passport. I, I technically I don't know. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, there's so there's the people that our agency work here with, in both of the one in Colorado here. They were there were people out in Romania, not the orphanage workers, but people that worked with them to get all this stuff this figured out. So they had to figure out things like. Um, the passport and other paperwork that they had to assemble. And there was an attorney there too that they worked with that helped when we did the gotcha day, went to the embassy and got all the, all the stuff officialized. And um, so they had all that paper for us and also some other background information on the, the biological parents. Um, not much, of course, you know, we don't have any health information really. Mm-hmm. So. so when 
you were doing the whole adoption process, did you pay special attention to like the local laws, the laws in Romania, international laws? I didn't. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. I, I think we kind of depended upon the lawyers and the adoption people to take care of all that stuff for us because mm -hmm. we weren't, there might have been things that we were never even aware of that we had to have taken care of. We just, they give us lists of things to do and we did them. Papers to fill out and we did them. Get these signed, get these notarized, all that stuff. Then we did what we were told to do, mm -hmm. basically. Now, I kind of want to move on to sort of, I guess, your perception of adoption overall. Did you ever learn about international adoption in school? No, I don't think I did. When I was growing up in the 70s, in college in the early 80s, um, no, I didn't know too much about it. Um, except, let me go back, I, my, I have cousins first cousins that were adopted that we met that were from California and I just thought that was interesting well that's unique they were domestically adopted um and when we visited them I mean they looked like their parents it didn't even occur to me that it, it was different so um and, and and I didn't think of them differently than I would have you know there might uh, you know you say oh, they're I just, they're my cousins, and so I, I, I didn't have a whole lot of experience with it. But then, um, once I started thinking about it, it just made a lot of sense. And because I think all life's valuable, I want to support that too. So that was part of I've, I've thought that way um, since I was a young teenager that I couldn't understand why abortion would ever be considered because there's families out there that can adopt and want to adopt and can give them good homes. So, um, you know, people didn't talk about that stuff as much. And I'd heard about, you know, domestic adoptions, but never about international at that point. I don't know how much it was happening. And, um, but there, I knew once we started looking into it, that people that we knew or people at church had already adopted internationally. And so their children were older. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to them for advice? I might have. I, I, I don't remember too well. But I would, if I'd met somebody, I would say, oh, we're looking into that. I, I, I'm, I'm usually good about doing that one. He's like, oh, we're going to do that too. Tell us what you know. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I can't remember anything specific about that. Do you feel like the culture around international adoption has changed in any way I since think, when you adopted? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's even become more accepted. I think there were maybe back when I was growing up, a child, it would have been such more, so much more of a novelty, um, and there might have been. And I heard stories of people like not accepting their adopted children, even if they were domestically adopted and looked like them, but, you know, that's not my grandchild or something, you'd hear people saying things like that, or they don't look like me, so I'm not going to, I'm going to only love these grandchildren. You'd hear those horrible stories, but I, um, I could never imagine my family or my parents or in-laws thinking that way, um, and they never did, and, um, and I think it's, I think that that has improved even more so. Um, um, I, and because now, I mean, it's hard to tell if someone's adopted or not, too. They can have parents that are, you know, that that's all, it was never even a problem for me either, thinking of um, interracial couples and stuff, that they could have children that don't look much like, like them. A friend of mine was married to very, um, Irish looking, fair, fair color, married to an Hispanic man. And she was, um, had her, her, her son who looks very Hispanic little son. And he was, um, they were at the park and people were trying to tell her he's not, he can't be your son. It's like it's my son, you know? So it's been funny. Mm -hmm. The acceptance thing. Have people ever reached out to you for advice? 
Yeah. Yeah, especially after, you know, and especially in those early groups, people do, you know, they're, if they're interested in doing that, um, they do like to, um, to ask you how things went, you know, how, um, you know, what was it like and um, how did they, how did they um, adapt to, you know, being in a, in a home and a family and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think especially when we would go to some of those um, local family events, too, if there's waiting couples, like, oh, they're going to Romania, hopefully, in the next few months, or, or they're going to Vietnam. And then I also had some friends at work that adopted from Russia or Vietnam or Romania, and so we would talk about, and some from the same agency um, that we find out later, oh, you went through the same agency, um, that they... I'll, um, you know, if there were certain things, maybe it was, again, you know, therapeutic things or for help in catching up at school or occupational therapy, um, all kinds of stuff. Is there any advice that you think is a must have for prospective parents to know? Um, hmm. I would say, not a must have, but I, I just think it's important to, to cherish your child, whether they're adopted or biological, in the same way. And I think if you love them, no matter where their, um, where their life began, as if they're yours, from that moment, as if they're this, you know, um, then, then you, you know, you just can't go wrong because you're loving them the way God wants you to love them, the way, you know, um, any mother would love your child, and and don't think of them as different, as as like, well, this or that, it's mm -hmm. not because, like I said, I believe God's still given you them, and in it. Somebody said something about they may not be born in your, um, from your body, but they're born in your heart, which is almost even better. So they're born in your heart, and they so they're truly your child. Just love them, and just help them the best you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In your experience, have people treated your children differently because of it? I don't think so. I mean, it's. I guess it's possible if there's some kind of a. If there's some kind of an attitude about it, um, but I, I've not. That I can't think of any experiences where someone has said something differently. I kind of remember another mom reaching out to me, but this was recent about any kind of attachment disorders because she adopted a son of a different race that. Um, than her, and you know, she just was kind of, and 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 he seems to have some issues with intellectual things too, but is also a really good athlete, like my daughter. So she had, she was asking me a lot of questions about the athlete mm -hmm. thing and how can can they do things like Special Olympics without, um, you know, being seeing themselves as like not that that's another whole issue. You know, can mm -hmm. you accept yourself enough to be able to to be in an organization that's geared for people with intellectual differences, um, they have to the the child can the child accept that part of who they are mm -hmm. and not um, be ashamed of it. I guess is what you'd say because some of them struggle with that, and and that's understandable. Um, so she was kind of reaching out to me in that, like how how to you know, make them feel more comfortable in that role. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you the first person in your family, like immediate family to have adopted? Well, internationally, in my immediate family, yes. Like I said, my aunt did adopt two children um, by, by domestic adoptions, but um, yeah, I was the first one. And it's kind of interesting that my sister adopted twice from international countries as a single mom. I was 
very impressed by her ability to do that. And um, thought she was crazy. <laughs> but I guess I could go on to that whole subject because I was very worried about her. But, um, but she's done great and um, married and her husband accepts those, those children as his own now too. And, um, and, and, oh gosh, we're doing that. But what's, what else is funny is that on our little block that we grew up on, my best friend adopted two children from Russia. This is later in life. You know, I don't, we don't live close or anything. And I think another, um, next door neighbor adopted some children too. So it just was crazy that none of us and all of us grew up on this block in this, you know, small homes in upstate New York and, um, Nobody was adopted in those homes, and it's just funny that we all ended up adopting internationally. And I don't think of it as like, oh, this is a trendy thing to do. It just, you know, I think we all loved our families, and we all loved children, and just ended up going that route. So. Mm -hmm. Did your sister ever come to you for advice? Oh, she did, yes. Yeah. What advice did you give her? I, well, I was big sister who was a little bit concerned. Can you handle this? Can you, you know, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and you don't know what you're getting into, but, but I was excited too for her because I, I wanted some, some little, um, nieces too. I think I thought that would be kind of fun. Um, and for, for my kids to have some cousins nearby, cause she ended up moving close. So she was a big help to me when our daughter was young and, um, so what else was our advice I'd give her? It was a little bit different because as I wasn't a single mom, so I couldn't give her too much advice on that respect, but I did, you know, say I would be there for her and help her. Um, so we've kind of been very supportive of each other, and she helps me and I help her, different things. Um, and and we just, again, it, it's, it's her faith has really helped her to get through circumstances in her life that she's had to face and um but I, I know she just absolutely loves her daughters and that makes her whole life so good I I still remember going with her to help her pick to get her her daughter from China her first child and it just makes me cry and I think about how she just was so happy and so excited and the night before she went to to get her daughter she set out all the little clothes and toys on the bed in such a beautiful way, like it was going to be Christmas Day. And so when her daughter would come into the room, she'd see all this special stuff for her. And I just, I love that my sister could do that. And to be able to, um, you know, she was just overjoyed to have her own child because she wasn't able to have any children biologically either at that, you know, her point in time. Did you notice any differences between adopting as a married couple versus adopting as a single parent? I think it would have been it was a lot harder physically as a single parent because, and again, it depends on how um, the child is doing. Um, but if they're getting up at night a lot and you're having, you're getting a lot less sleep, um, that's very hard. It's hard. There's a lot of decisions to make too on, um, deciding, do you think, you know, our child needs to have help with this area? Who can help with, um, you know, the, the homework? Who can help when they're sick? Who can do this? At least we had each other to kind of go back and forth with, um, and we had a son who could run and fetch things if he needed it too. But when my sister adopted, it was harder for her in a lot of ways. And I always felt like, all right, I'll come over. Just let me know when you need anything. Because I know it can be so tough when you're very tired and if they're crying or something. I don't think she had too much trouble. So, but because her daughter was very, um, pretty easy in, in some ways and very lovable <laughs> so it was very good experience for her um that's why she wanted to go and adopt another because <laughs> it was such a good experience so having seen both an orphanage in romania and presumably an orphanage in china 
how do the two compare? I really think, I mean, that the Chinese um, director of the orphanage was a lot more um, up to date on, if that's the right word, on the child care and taking, you know, having the children learn from a very young age you know, they were learning and, and they had routines and things that they went through that were very beneficial because I could see that in my niece that she was at a young age able to um, understand a lot of things comprehend a lot of things and speak to she was really able to catch up I don't know if that's the case for all Chinese um, adopted children but um, it seemed to be maybe the way they ran the orphanage and maybe not every orphanage is the same either over there but that one seemed to be have a really good way of taking care of those babies because they get them very young too and that if they were um raised with a lot more early um intervention with reading and speak being spoken to and a lot of eye-to-eye -eye contact with an adult or a caregiver I think that really makes a huge difference in how they are able to learn and adapt and grow. Um, as long as they feel loved, too. I think the children need to have that feel safe and loved. And I think, you know, you, we can give that to um I think that maybe my daughter has some of that. But she just didn't have the early one-on-one um, -on -one um, verbal, you know, talking, come and talking to her and teaching her things that, to develop language skills that really help the brain. So I think that could have been, I, of course, I'm only guessing because I don't know what causes some of that issue, but um, there was a definite, I think there was definitely a difference in how they were raised from infants. Mm -hmm. I guess to wrap up this interview, if you could describe your experience with adoption in a single sentence, what would it be? Um, I am so grateful that I was able to adopt my daughter. It's been, you know, my life, the same way I'm grateful for my son, but I'm so grateful because this is not a child born to me. This is a child born to someone else. And so it's a, a huge privilege to be able to raise this child that someone else gave life to. Um, it's truly a gift. It's truly hard work. Um, there's there's heartache, but it's it's so worth it all. It's um, such a wonderful blessing. Well, thanks for having me, Bud. Thank you.